welcome in. It is Big Ten today. It is great to have you with us on this Thursday. I'm Dave Revson. A ton of hoop stock coming up, men's and women's. A lot to unpack there. But after what happened Monday night in Houston, football remains our big story, and specifically the Michigan Wolverines. They are celebrating, their fans still celebrating the 12th national title in school history, first in 26 years. A three touchdown win over Washington Monday. The Mays and Blue finished 15 0. 11 of those wins coming by 20 or more points held the Huskies to a season low 13 points in the national championship game win. The Big Ten Network's Jake Butt joins me now. Jake, we were down there in Houston together. It was a glorious evening for Michigan football. We've had a few days to process it now. Is there a moment that stands out to you the most? Oh, I don't know if there's a moment that stands out more than just generally how the, the feeling that I had down there, Dave. Like, it's it's just what a, what an unbelievable season. Like, what a ride. The, the emotional roller coaster. Football's always an emotional roller coaster. Um, and then for it to conclude in the way it did, I mean, I know the final score uh, showed that Michigan dominated, which they did. But Washington, they made it challenging for a, a large stretch there in the middle of the game. Michigan couldn't quite close out, uh, which which kind of kept us all on the edge of our seats. But maybe the moment, Dave, is is the Mikey Sainer still interception. Yeah. Returns it all the way down inside the 10. The captain, the leader, the 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 character of Mikey Sainer still returns it. And I'm glad he got tackled because then the captain, the leader, the character. Those who stay will be champions. Blake Corum gets to punch it in the end zone. I just thought that that was poetic the way that game closed out. You know, it's interesting. My big thought was that it just felt like, and I think the Rose Bowl felt similar in some ways. It felt like a catharsis for everyone associated with the program, from the coaches and players to really the fans. I mean, I just kind of think back to really the early years of the Big Ten Network. I mean, you go like 2008 to 2014. This was a program that no one feared in the Big Ten. It was a good, not great program. There were some years it wasn't even a good program. And then Jim Harbaugh came, and they steadily started to build. But there was still this feeling of, could they compete with Ohio State? Or were they going to be second fiddle to them kind of on a permanent basis? And then they passed them. And then there's the thought of, okay, we're the best in the Big Ten, but can Michigan get to a point where they can compete for a national championship. And it just felt like there were all these steps along the way. And I think Michigan fans and and maybe even the players and the coaches had some doubts at each step of the way. And when they finally got there, got to the top of that mountain, it was like you could exhale. And, and it felt like yes. collectively everyone in the stadium did that on Monday night from, from where I sat. Oh, extremely well said, Dave. And that's that's part of, you know, you know, what when I was reflecting about this, like, you know, I was in high school. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. I grew up in a, a Buckeye fan. So I, I've seen the perception of Michigan as a program from both sides of the aisle. And I've seen it change and grow and develop. I've seen it uh, rise. I've seen it fall. Uh, when I committed to Michigan back in 2011, they won the Sugar Bowl. It was Brady Hoke's first year. They beat Ohio State. And it was like, wow, this program is back up and up. And I felt, you know, when I committed there, like I'm going to play in a couple Rose Bowls. I'm going to compete for a national title. I genuinely believe that. And then my first year in 2013, we lost. We went seven and six. I think we lost five of those games by a combined 11 points. Hard heartbreaking Penn State back-to-back Hail Marys Christian Hackenberg uh Ohio State 42-41 a a game we had no business being in based on our collective record that season and we lost on a two-point conversion and it's like I remember postseason there where we talked we're like guys I know we're seven and six but we're close we're really close we lost so many games by a, a thin margin so we went into the 2014 season saying all right we're gonna get this one back and we had spring ball and a good camp and it's like hey we're gonna make something we're gonna make a splash and get that respect back on michigan's name uh we were booed in our own stadium in 2014 i mean we would we would literally talk to each other we'd go on the road to play rutgers and they booed us 
And we're like, wow, well, we get booed louder in our own stadium. I mean, seriously, think about what that is, you know, for a Michigan player and, and Michigan fans. The, the fans chanted to fire our head coach during a game. They chanted to fire our athletic director during a game. I mean, seriously, think about the paradox and the different viewpoints back then. Back then in 2014, we were not even thinking about a bowl game. We weren't thinking about a conference title. We were wondering, you know, are, you know, are, are we who we say we are? Like, who are we? I don't know. And we made changes that off season. And I saw Jim Hackett at the Rose Bowl and I shook his hand and, and he was the interim AD at the time. And he sat us down that December because we didn't make a bowl game. We went five and seven in 2014. And he said, hey, what characteristics do you want in a head coach? And all of us said, we don't care if it's hard. We don't care if it's frustrating. We don't care what it takes. We just want to win. We want to be respected. And the perfect man for that job was Jim Harbaugh because it certainly wasn't easy in those early years. The practices are – I don't even have enough time to fully explain how challenging <laughs> they were. And we got to a level of respect, back-to-back 10-win seasons. And yet, to your point, Dave, couldn't beat Ohio State, couldn't beat Michigan State, put it, we won a bowl game in 2015, then we lost one to Florida State. And it's like, okay, the program's back. There's respect – but not that national respect, not that next level where you, where, where, where you win championships you get. And, and then it wasn't linear. It wasn't linear. After 20, 2015, 2016, it's like, okay, the program's trending in the right direction. This is great. Until 2020, and it took a huge step back, almost right back to where we were when I went back in that 2014 season, the way we felt. Fans wanting to fire our coach, Jim Harbaugh. Fans calling for that. Two and four. Michigan State comes into the big house and steamrolls Michigan in Mel Tucker's first year. And it was eerie for a number of reasons. It was COVID because there was no fans in the stadium. It was so eerie. And I remember I remember how I felt there, a pit in my stomach, like, what is going on, man? Is Michigan cursed? Genuinely thinking that. And you think about the past three years with Aiden Hutchinson, the, the, the way he led that team in 2021, 0.1% chance of winning the Big Ten, uh, entering the season unranked. They win the Big Ten. They beat Ohio State. You, you lose to Georgia. 2022, hey, you beat Ohio State once. Anyone can do it once. Can you do it again? Can you do it in Columbus? Nearly two decades since the last time that happened, and they do it again. C.J. Stroud, the Buckeyes had a phenomenal team that year. C.J. Stroud, I mean, we, we leads the Texans to the playoffs. You know, this year in, in in his first year, I mean, unbelievable team, unbelievable athletes, talent all over the place. Ryan Day, a phenomenal coach, and Michigan gets it done in the big house. And then you're going to play TCU, and you're saying, "Can't wait to see the rematch, Georgia and Michigan for the national title." It was a foregone conclusion hmm. that Michigan was going to win in that semifinal, and they didn't get it done. Think about the frustration of that moment. And yet Blake Corum, who gets injured, says, we'll be back. J.J. McCarthy says, we'll be back. Mikey Sainer still says, we'll be back. And every year, players make these promises. But Michigan and this team and this head coach and Jim Harbaugh, they delivered on their promises. They put the work in. And I think for all those reasons, I know I just kind of went and gave you a, a State of the Union address there. But that <laughs> that is that fully encapsulates the emotion of this moment. You know, Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, the teams that dominated the, the, the early part of this four-team college football playoff, it was an expectation and a standard that they were going to be there and win. And for Michigan, I, I say all that to paint the picture of this being a, a decade-long-plus journey to get there. And for those reasons, that's why it's so emotional. Jake, what's next? <laughs> what's next, Dave, is... We're, who, first off, celebrate, as Coach Harbaugh said. Celebrate, enjoy the moment, be present. What's next is, what's Jim Harbaugh going to do? And Ward, your interview with Ward was one of the best interviews of the year. Ward and President Santa Ono has done, have done as good of a job as you can ask to let Jim Harbaugh know that whatever you need to be here, we want to have you and we'll support you. Uh, but Jim's earned the right. Coach Harbaugh's earned the right to make the best decision for himself. I will support him wherever he goes, as, as I know a lot of my teammates and fans will. And then what's J.J. McCarthy going to do? That's another big answer is your head coach and your quarterback are the two biggest answers that will need to be addressed here in the coming months, weeks. Well, we will look ahead a little bit here as uh, you and I will 
join together a little bit later in the show once again and talk about not just Michigan's future, but future for the Big Ten in this upcoming season. Great insights, Jake. Again, it was a ton of fun to experience all this with you. Hang tight. We'll get back to you in just a few minutes. In the meantime, though, we'll continue tonight. Northwestern shot 61% on the road, overcame a season-high 18 turnovers to top Penn State. Brooks Barnheiser, a career-high 23 points. And Wisconsin's still perfect in the conference. They finished the game on a 19-4 run. Max Klesman, all 18 of his points in the second half as the Badgers took down Ohio State. And nobody had a better seat for that one than Andy Katz. He was on the sidelines in Columbus. And here I am. And here he is through the magic of, of air travel and yes. dedication to the cause. Get on a Thank tube you. of toothpaste and get over here. Thank you very much, yes, <laughs> for, uh, for, for your hustle. Uh, let's talk about Wisconsin, first of all, the game you were at. Uh, the Badgers are still undefeated in the Big Ten. Max Klesmet was unbelievable down the stretch in this game. But I think it just really pointed out to me, Andy, man, the Badgers have a lot of weapons. This is a deep team. I mean, A.J. Storr was phenomenal in the first half. He was barely a factor in the second half. But it didn't matter. And, and that's the difference between this Wisconsin team this year and a year ago. All right, right here, right now, we have to start taking Wisconsin seriously. If you haven't already. I was already taking them seriously. Okay. I started taking them seriously well, on December to the 19th. the nation here. Yeah. Um, everyone's got to start taking them seriously. Obviously, we've been Purdue all the time, which is understandable. They still are one of the favorites to win the national championship, let alone this conference, although they're now two games behind the Badgers. Right. Um, they haven't played them yet. But this is a legitimate team that could win, I think, four games to get the Phoenix. Will they? We don't know. But they have the talent to do so. They are different. They're scoring with ease. They have multiple weapons. On Saturday, um, out of the blue, Connor Asijian suddenly makes some threes. Tyler Wall is playing some of his best basketball, obviously, overall. Chucky Hepburn is spotty, but then he'll hit a big shot. And then in the second half, Mr. Glue Guy, I think maybe the best glue guy in the league right now, Max Klesman. 18 points, big shot after big shot to really extend the lead, and more importantly, defensively. Right. Because Jamison Battle got off in the first half. He turned off that spigot in the second. I mean, he wants that assignment. You know, here's a guy, played at Wofford, sort of a little unheralded. And he accepts those big-time assignments. And then inside, Stephen Crawl, who I was documenting throughout the course of the day, he banged knees, had the contusion, kind of limping around, says he wanted to play. He plays, but they wanted to use Nolan Winter more. And now I think he made a big shot, made a three. He's a better offensive player, you'd say at least a stretch out, maybe not there post-wise. But now they've got a bit of a one-two punch inside with Crawl and Winter that they can alternate. So there's even more depth at the five spot for Wisconsin. They're playing with so much confidence. Uh, they're a different team, obviously, with what happened at Providence. That's more of the, that's more of the outlier. Right. And look, the Arizona game maybe was not a bad matchup when it came, um, but they've been on a tear since that game, without question. Well, they've been incredible. A 12th win of the year, 11 of them by double-figure margins. I mean, they are absolutely rolling right now and I agree with everything you said I mean I just think they have a lot of really good pieces they've proven they can win in different ways I mean this was a little bit more of a grinded out game last night but then we saw back to back Iowa and Nebraska they were over the course of 40 minutes second half Iowa first half Nebraska they scored 102 points and we got to so mention proven, John Blackwell as they well. can be up tempo they have one of the best freshmen yeah. in the Big Ten and John Blackwell no they are they are really good uh, Ohio State Look, this is still a, a good team. I, I think you and I think they have one of the best backcourts in the Big Ten. There's a lot to like about the Buckeyes, but two straight losses here. What was your vibe being around them yesterday? So, first of all, I, I would put a little bit of an asterisk there. When they're playing well, they're one of the best backcourts, if not the best backcourt. The problem is Roddy Gale has not been consistently right. playing at a high level. Um, they have a true point guard in Thornton. Uh, obviously, Scotty Middleton is improving but isn't there yet. Battle has been pretty consistent as a veteran presence um, on and off the court, but he got locked down a little in the second half. I think their big problem is inside more than anything. I know they need Gale to elevate to be who they could be, but, you know, Akbar is just not that offensive a player. Right. I mean, he's a runner, a jumper. He can maybe block some shots. But Zed Key, I mean, he's just not producing the way he used to. Only had a couple of buckets off the bench. 
they really almost get no bench production. I think they got a total of eight or nine points last night. So that has to improve. Um, they're not very deep as comparison to Wisconsin. So that relies heavily on Gail Thornton battle right. really to carry this team. Right. And if one of those guys has an off night, you're in trouble. And I do think that's the issue. And then they just haven't closed out games well. Multiple Andy. games I mean, they haven't. You look at the, just these last two games, the two games they've lost, Indiana and Wisconsin, they scored 54 points total in the second halves combined. So 40 minutes. Yeah, this wasn't an 11 point game. Points. No, 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 I know. I mean, yeah. it, it was. Right. But it wasn't. Exactly. Right. No, yes. no. I mean, it, th th this was a, a much closer game than the final score indicated. Hey, how about Northwestern going on the road and beating Penn State last night? That was something Ohio State couldn't do. Penn State beat them. Northwestern was in a hole for most of this game, kind of figured out a way to battle out of it. I mean, they turned the ball over at an alarming rate for a team that takes great care of the ball. But you know what? They figured out a way, and that's what good teams do. Yeah, I mean, it, this was, I thought, an imperative win. To follow up a big time when they had Sunday against Michigan State, with a road win, you know, in a very difficult place to play because there was no atmosphere, it's cold, you're there, and you're playing against a team that had just had a pretty good win at the Palestra. Um, but to win a game with 18 turnovers, and Penn State goes 3-17 of 17 on threes, so defensively they did a much better job on the perimeter. Barnheiser is now looks to be healthy. Barry's been more consistent with Boo. So... This is a monster win, especially with Wisconsin coming up on Saturday. Yeah, on Barnheiser's been bothered by a little yes. bit of a hand injury, but he shot the ball much better here these last couple of games, and so it does seem like there's some progress being made there. And Yeah, you talk about the front half of Northwestern's schedule is much more difficult than the back half of their conference schedule. So if you can kind of keep your head above water here in the first half, get wins like this, and then look, they've got a win over Purdue and a win over Michigan State in their back pocket. Those are huge Don't wins. Don't dismiss Dayton. Right now, the Dayton's the best team in the A-10. Right. They beat Dayton at home. They won on the road against Arizona State or quasi-road games. So there are some decent wins there, no, no question about it. Uh, Penn State, very quick thoughts on Nittany Lions. Again, it's a closeout issue. I mean, the Plester game is a little bit different. Michigan was struggling. It's a great atmosphere. But they've had a real problem closing games uh, outside of the comeback against Ohio State. They've got to fix that. Kanye Cleary has been by far their best player. Um, they got to get a little bit more out of their inside game as well. Yeah, Cleary, one of the most improved players in yes. the country. He's the most improved scorer in the Power Five. He has scored more than 20 points in six of the last eight games. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. I'm looking forward. I've got them Saturday against Purdue, a game you can see here on the Big Ten Network. Hey, Jake, we're talking about a guy who's 72 years old who has incredibly accomplished. I mean, in some senses, it obviously makes perfect sense, and you don't think, wow, this is crazy. But it is crazy to think about college football without Nick mm. Saban. So as you think and try to process this decision and the greatness of his career, what stands out to you? Oh, my gosh. I mean, truly a legend, be, be even beyond that word, because we'll refer to a lot of people as legends. I think Saban is in a category of his own, uh, the greatest college football coach of all time. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people as they've reflected on this saying, man, his record speaks for itself. And it certainly does. I do not know every single detail, every intricacy of his record. I, I know he won a lot of games. I know he won a lot of championships. I can't rattle off all the details. But what stands out to me about Saban and for us, Dave, to have been there in person for his final game, what stands out about Saban is the way he made me feel and the way he made everyone around him feel. When Saban is on the sideline for the Alabama Crimson Tide, you expected his team to win always, always. That's, that's the making of a legend. Truly, there is not a game where, they, where Saban was down there as the head coach that anyone expected anything less from greatness, uh, of greatness from his team um, and greatness from himself. A great leader, uh, a great, I mean, you listen to him talk about culture, leadership, a pioneer for the game. Um, I just want to say congratulations to him. I wish him the best in his retirement. I know that this is really hard for coaches because it's such a sacrifice. It becomes a big part of your identity. Um, this is not an easy thing to do to walk away from the game. I can't help but but question, Dave, if 
you know, the current state of college football with NIL and the transfer portal has something to do with the decision. You know, it has never been harder to be a college football coach than it is today. Um, But, you know, it'll be very interesting, man. We lost a legend that won't be on the sidelines as the head coach for Alabama next year. Uh, The game's always better with him on the sideline, but he, you know, he's earned the right to enjoy his retirement. So I wish him the best. No doubt. You talk about the details of his accomplishments. How about this one? Between 2008 and 2022, 15 straight years, they were number one in the nation at some point. This year, that streak ended. They peaked it at number three. It was an off year for Alabama. They all made it to to number three. Incredible. Uh, Let's spin it ahead. Stuart Mandel of The Athletic is way too early top 25. He had the tide at number two going into next year behind Georgia. The Big Ten very well represented Got future member Oregon third, Ohio State fourth, Michigan sixth, future member Washington seventh. So four of the top seven. Penn State also there at 18, which seems low to me. Iowa is 22. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's start with Michigan. We kind of touched on them a a little bit earlier, but a lot of unknowns, I think, would be the the biggest thing here, Jake. There certainly is the potential for them to be in the hunt again. What would it take for them to repeat as national champs? Oh, man, it's going to take everything, Dave, and and even everything may not be enough for Michigan, right? Then they're going to need some things to bounce in their favor. That schedule, as you see there, notable opponents, Texas, USC, at Washington, Oregon, of course, at Ohio State, can never discredit the rivalry game with Michigan State and what they have with their new head coach, new quarterback. They're going to be a much improved team. Um, And that's not even to mention the fact we don't know who their head coach will be. We do not know who their quarterback will be. So in terms of uh, challenges, it's always challenging to repeat going all the way and playing 15 games and uh, playing them completely clean and finishing the season undefeated. That's it's always a challenge to get back up your off seasons shorter. Um, But to to repeat next year, that's going to be a really challenging year. This, this this team, though, Michigan, as a program, is in as good of a place as it has been in decades, maybe ever, in terms of culture, recruiting, talent. Uh, you know, there's no reason anyone should doubt that Michigan can accomplish great things. Tons of star power on defense. To me, the questions are on offense with the offensive line. Does J.J. come back? But, man, defensively, they should be really good. Will Johnson, Mason Graham. Yes. You can go down the list. Uh, Washington and Oregon, as we see, both poised for big years. The Ducks got both Dante Moore and Dylan Gabriel in the portal, which is crazy. Uh, It feels like offensively they'll be great. And when you have Dan Lanning in charge, you know you're going to have a really good defense. They seem to be like the team that has the best chance in the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you if you had to pick one right now, I think the consensus for a large group of people would probably say Oregon is the team to beat in the Big Ten. Uh, They were excellent this year you know they just couldn't get over washington washington beat them twice uh so we'll see how that 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 gameplay and that relationship maybe we have uh you know a growing rivalry on our hands uh but what dan lanning's done you know planting seeds and, and laying bricks the foundation for this program they're in an excellent place of course the brand and what they have with nike uh that matters more than ever in today's college football landscape the quarterback position, unlike Michigan, they got today, tomorrow, and the next day figured out there. Uh, so they're they're in an excellent spot. But again, it's going to be interesting now because Dan Lanning's name has been thrown around early, early for a potential replacement for Alabama. I mean, this is the revolving door of, of coaching changes in college football. Uh, as it stands right now, Oregon is loaded. Again, we'll have to follow through this offseason to see what their roster and coaching staff looks like going into uh, fall camp. Some questions with Washington, obviously, as well. Michael Penix is gone. Will Rogers is going to replace him from Mississippi State. But uh, we shall see. They lose a lot of that receiver star power, too. But never count out Kalen DeBoer. You know they're going to be right. really good. And you certainly can't count out the Buckeyes, either. They've gotten some good news. Emeka Abuka is coming back. So that wide receiver crew is solidified heading into next year. Obviously, the Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, expectation of, of him departing, but you got Will Howard, a quarterback. You got one of the best running backs out of the portal, Quinshawn Judkins from Mississippi, who's one of the best running backs in the country this year. Defensively, Denzel Burke has announced that he's coming back, so that corner group might be the, the best corner room 
in the country. There's a lot to like with the Buckeyes. I think the question is just do you get better quarterback play, Jake? Yes, I mean, you just laid it out there to get Judkins. I mean, I was shocked to see him enter the portal. I think a lot of us were um, in a prized, prized recruit. Goes to Columbus, and we don't even know. Travion Henderson, it seems like the whispers are saying he, there's a very high chance, from what I've heard, that he's more likely to return than leave. I uh, expect Marvin Harrison Jr. to leave. But as we know, Ohio State, they're deep there at the receiver position. You know, Will Howard uh, coming in at quarterback, I, you know, to me, maybe not. He doesn't have the talent, true passing talent of a C.J. Stroud. But here's my comparison to him. What I expect him to be, how about J.T. Barrett? who I don't know that there's been a more effective quarterback. JT Barrett, if it was third and four or fourth and four, you always felt he was going to be able to get you five or six. In the biggest moments, he would tuck the ball and run if he needed to. He'd throw it if he needed to. Um, just a guy that was always in the right place at the right time and, and made the necessary plays. Um, you know, of course, just played within himself, too, with all the talent. And, you know, this Ohio State team, they are loaded. They're loaded top to bottom. The roster's loaded. Uh, Jim Knowles obviously took huge steps forward for that Buckeye defense this year. You'd imagine in year three, he'll take further steps. You look at the trend for him at Oklahoma State, this is the point I've been making, is it's a very complex, aggressive defense. There's layers and layers and layers to it. If you want to be aggressive, you got to make sure you're not vulnerable. Those are the layers. Oklahoma State, he got better year one, year two, year three. There was a clear trend of improvement. You'd expect to see the same thing in Columbus. So the Buckeyes, this is a huge year for Ryan Day. It's a huge year for their program. And as it sits right now, they're positioned really well to make a splash. Yeah, I think so, too. Personnel-wise on defense, they should be really good. And as you say, then, the improvement in terms of the scheme. To me, the question marks are on the offense and, and specifically on that quarterback spot. Got time to touch on one more. Let's talk about Penn State. I mean, I know two new coordinators, and I get all that. Mm -hmm. There's... There's a lot of change in Happy Valley. But, man, I think 18 is really low for them. I think there's a lot of talent on this team, and I like their schedule next year as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it, James Franklin's recruited well. I mean, about as good as, as anybody in the conference and in the country. The, the roster is loaded with talent. As you know, they went into the transfer portal. Julian Fleming, I mean, the biggest issue this year was, hey, who's going to be your wide receiver one? Well, Fleming was a former five-star. Right, so they they have talent on this roster. The two young backs, Singleton and Allen, explosive year one back in 2022. I wouldn't call it a bad year this year in 23, but maybe kind of had a little bit of a sophomore. Uh, I don't even want to call it a slump, but it just wasn't up to standard. I'd imagine they bounce back this year. The running game gets going. It all comes down to Drew Aller, though. You know, the five star, the guy that was brought in to take Penn State to new heights. Clearly got all the talent in the world. I want to see his progression. I think this team's ceiling and floor and record will ultimately be decided by his play. Don't have to play Michigan next year. Don't play Oregon either. So I think there are a couple. Yeah. And no one's going to have a break in the Big Ten schedule. No one's going to have an easy schedule in this 18-team Big Ten. But I kind of like the way it, it lays out there for Penn State. So, again, I, I feel like 18 is uh, selling them a little bit short. Jake Buck, great stuff, man. Uh, really, really appreciate it, and we will talk to you soon. It's been awesome, man. It's been a fun year with you, Dave. Thanks for everything. National Coach of the Year, Terry Morin of Indiana, is with us. A coach, 5-0 and in conference play, first time ever for your program. Give us an assessment of where you feel like you guys stand heading into that big showdown. Well, I think we all feel, uh, you know, we have a lot of confidence. Uh, you know, one of the things, Dave, with our team is uh, as the year has progressed, we've, we've shown great balance. You know, we've had different different kids step up at different times, uh, you know, certainly with uh, an All-American that we have in McKenzie Holmes and, you know, being able to, um, you know, have those shooters on the outside uh, you know we've made it difficult I think for other opponents but um, you know, I'm really proud I think our defense has come a long way you know since the very early uh, season uh, loss to Stanford uh, you know we have we knew we were going to be a different team than we were a year ago we've continued to to really work on that side of the ball um, and so um, you know we're defending at a high level which uh, you know I, I like uh, but we're also our ability to to score the ball as well is also you know happening for our team. And so the combination of the two 
um, you know, is, is, has pointed us in, in a really great direction. It's interesting you brought up the game against Stanford that's your only loss of the year. It was very mm -hmm. early in the year, and they really pounded you. And I guess it's just interesting. I always think the beauty of basketball is – that you can lose games really at any point in the year and you'll be fine. Right. It's very different than college yeah. football, which we just started stop covering where, you know, any loss seems cataclysmic in some sort of a strange way. Did the Stanford game help you? I mean, does it allow you to a turn the page and say, Hey, this is a new year and B yeah. get your team to focus on, Hey, we've got to defend better if we're going to win right. in the way we want to win. Well, there's, there's no doubt that it helped us. You know, I think what, what fans forget, people forget is, you know, although we won that championship last year, uh, we still returned with a different team. And, and just because you win a championship doesn't mean the next year you start in the middle of the mountain. You got to start all over just like everybody else does. And, um, and so for us, you know, I thought that that, that early loss uh, told us a lot. It told us a lot about all the things that we were going to have to improve on and get better uh, with being able to do. And, um, you know, we were certainly disappointed. We were a little bit embarrassed because of, um, you know, the score in itself. But um, I do think it was a blessing in disguise for our group. It was a, an early wake-up call in, in one in which we needed. And, um, you know, sure enough, we have watched ourselves – uh, as I say, morph into a better defensive team, uh, morph into a more efficient offensive team. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've been really proud of the progress that we've made, although, as we always say around here, there's more work to be done and there's still room, you know, for improvement. We did get a nice win last night, and we were talking about these huge margins of victory that you've had. That wasn't really the case yesterday. I mean, you no. were in a fairly significant hole against Penn State in the third quarter, dug yeah. your way out of yeah. it to win. What did you learn about your team, and, and what positives can you take from that comeback last night? Well, first of all, here's what we know. The Big Ten is really, really good. Yeah. And Carolyn has done an unbelievable job with her team I, in terms of they came out and pressured us and jumped on us from the beginning. Uh, and, um, you know, we um, dug ourselves a little hole there, had to get out of it. Um, you know, it told us, uh, told me a lot about, you know, what I already kind of knew about our group is that we, we don't hit the panic button. We rely on our experience. Uh, we rely on our, you know, our veterans uh, to, um, um, you know, to, to, to figure out how to score the ball. But what we had to do in that particular game was we had to get stops and we had to get a string of them. Uh, in order to to gain any sort of breathing room uh, with with Penn State and uh, like I said, Carolyn's done. That's a fantastic basketball team, uh, and um, you know it was it was uh, another good I, I think challenge for us to have to play from behind um, and figure out in in spite of turning the ball over the way we did. Uh, in spite of some some uh, slippage defensively, we still found a way to win, and um, that's what I'm you know I'm, I'm most proud of is that um, and this group stuck together and um, and we're able to sp string just enough stops um, you know to get that win. Coach, one of the big questions coming in this year was how you'd replace Grace Berger. You and I have talked many times over the last few years, mm -hmm. and you've been so effusive in your praise of her, and, and with good reason, just a fabulous player. Yeah. You obviously had Mackenzie Holmes, a, a tremendous post to, to build around. You've surrounded her with shooters. But but the big question was, how do they function without grace? In what ways yeah. do you feel like you have done that? Uh, you know, I think we've, again, Chloe, uh, you know, Moore McNeil has, has really stepped in and played a, a, a big part of that. You know, we needed another perimeter player that, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that Grace gave us was a, a guard, a penetrating guard uh, that could beat people off the bounce. You know, she she has a, you know, that that crazy mid range game. But you know, with Chloe, she's really started becoming aggressive, and we needed her to do that because we can't just be a, you know, catch and shoot team from the perimeter. We still have to put. Um, pressure on defenses to have to guard us off the off the dribble, uh, and so yeah, I think that Chloe has has stepped up. Um, you know, certainly Sarah, you know, has been phenomenal. Sid, you know, as of late has really shot the ball well. We need some more consistency from Yarden, 
Um, and then we've had great, great depth, you know, our play off the bench with Lexi Vargas are coming in and Lily Meister coming in and impacting the game, you know, for us um, has, has been instrumental. So, uh, you know, we, we've done it with a committee, you know, uh, you, you know, you never replace a kid like Grace Berger, uh, but everybody has to step up and do a little bit more. And, um, you know, I think Chloe has been the, the catalyst for us as far as, um, you know, being more aggressive uh, out on the perimeter. Let's talk a little bit about Saturday's game. It is a huge spotlight game, not just for your program, but for women's basketball. I mean, it's a prime mm-hmm. time game on Fox. You know, we've talked a lot in the past about, hey, this is an Indiana program that you know, they were getting four or 500 people at yeah. Assembly Hall for games. And now you just think about how massive the following is for your team, for this sport. Before we get in the matchup, what does a game like this mean for the sport in general well again i'm you know we're just so grateful to be a part of it what a what a uh, great time you know to be in women's basketball with the popularity of the sport um and uh, you know to, to uh you know play a team like iowa um you know two teams that have had <laughs> unbelievable battles you know in the last uh, you know, four or five years. And, um, you know, it's going to it's gonna make for hopefully great TV. Uh, you know, uh, anytime you can spotlight women's basketball, you know, two teams that want to play uh, pretty basketball, that want to play fast basketball, uh, that want fans and, and others uh, that maybe are just perhaps becoming, you know, women's basketball fans to see two teams that uh, move the ball, uh, both guard well, uh, both can shoot it, you know, at a high, a high clip. Um, you know, again, it's a great opportunity, I think, for both programs, uh, not just to, uh, you know, represent the Big Ten, but also, uh, you know, represent uh, women's basketball on a national level. You split two games against Iowa last year. You guys won the regular season title in the Big Ten. They won the Big Ten tournament championship. I mean, these were the two elite programs in the league a season ago. So you've seen them quite a bit here, and it means you've seen Caitlin Clark quite a bit. Yeah, obviously, mm-hmm. that is the number one focal point yeah. when you go into playing against Iowa. What's the approach for you guys against Caitlin? Well, again, you, you know, you hit it on the head. She is extraordinary talent. There's, there's no question about that. But, um, you know, she still has those pieces around her. Uh, you know, Kate Martin, Gabby Marshall. Uh, Stalky has has really played well for them uh, in you know replacing Cesano. Uh and so uh, you know this is a team that has really good pieces and they play well together. It's like a well-oiled machine. Uh, and and all, although you know a lot of it is is you know obviously with Kate having the ball in her hands a lot, uh, you know she can certainly you know everybody's talked about her ability to score. Uh, but what I've always been impressed with is just how phenomenal of a facilitator she is, uh, because you really can't help off any of them. Uh, you have to not only figure out how to guard Kate, uh, Caitlin, but you also can't take your chances uh, because she's so she's so great at reading s- coverages, reading situations, and being able to make plays that look really easy um, because of her. Uh, ability to pass the ball and her IQ. And so, um, you know, we will have to be sound. We will have to be disciplined. We will uh, have to, uh, you know, maybe muck it up a little bit, do some things, you know, out of character for us defensively, um, but um, but still be disciplined, you know. Um, but um, I, I think it, it does set up for a great, you know, evening of basketball. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, our defense will travel uh, over there and, uh, you know, we'll be able to make it hard, uh, you know, for Iowa tomorrow night or Saturday night. Cannot wait to watch you coach again, 730 Eastern time on Fox, the pride of Seymour, Indiana, Terry Morin. <laughs> Thanks a lot, coach. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you. Good to see you. Good games tonight in the big 10 on the men's side. They're on FS one Michigan visiting Maryland. That's the early one. The nightcap 10th ranked Illinois hosting Michigan state Spartans just one and three in the conference coming in and let's start there Andy you were there on Sunday Michigan State lost to Northwestern Tom Izzo absolutely laid into his team in the post game the issue is if you're laying into your team with the hopes of lighting a fire and bouncing back with a big win Champagne is a tough place to do that yeah but we've seen Michigan State do this before when their backs are against the wall they rise up to the challenge obviously he lit into the team earlier this season 
um, where you would think that he was going to sort of, you know, over the heads of the veterans, have the rookies. Um, now he doesn't necessarily have that. He needs these guys to play well. And not to pick on Malik Hall, but it really is crazy, the swing from the Penn State game when he had 24, 5, and 4, and then in goose eggs in points and rebounds against Northwestern. I mean, it, I, I don't understand it. I mean, not one point, not right. one rebound, and he has to produce. Hogard, Aikens, Walker, you know, decent. But all four of them really have to play well for Michigan State to reach its potential. You know, inside, they're going to get what they're going to get from Sissoko, Cooper Kohler. Um, you know, it is what it is inside. Uh, and then Trey Holloman off the bench. He's sort of pretty much the only replacement guard. So uh, they're going to have to play maybe their best game tonight if they're going to win this game. Yeah, Illinois is really good. Illinois at home is fabulous. Yeah, only one loss. It was to Marquette uh, way early in the season. Domas, Guerriere, they've stepped up to the challenge. You know, the big question mark, I think, for them is Ty Rogers. Right. You know, how consistent he is. Maybe Justin Harmon's had great games. Coleman Hawkins, I think, is going to be a real matchup problem for Michigan State. So, but, but never discount a Tom Izzo team over the last couple of days. I'm sure he has them ready for tonight. Really quickly, I, I do want to talk about Michigan-Maryland. It's very interesting, and we touched on this briefly last night on the big show, but Michigan announced yesterday that Doug McDaniel, who is their leading scorer, who is their point guard, who plays the most minutes of any player in the Big Ten, is now not going to play road games for the foreseeable future due to academics. Fill us in here. Well, I found out from the Michigan staff that he is allowed to play in home games, so he can't be completely ineligible if that's the case uh, academically. So clearly they're disciplining him on the road, uh, will be allowed to potentially play at home, Jalen Llewellyn will start in his place in this game against Maryland. A Maryland team, by the way, that also is really good at home. Only one loss at home, and that was to Purdue. Right, yes, 8-1 and one at home this year. McDaniel, Washington, D.C. guy. This was yeah. going to be a homecoming really disappointing. game for him. So we'll see how that impacts what's already been a really rough Michigan season. We're going to do this again tomorrow. Yes. Andy, back with me. Same we'll place. see you for Friday's Big Ten Today.